Welcome to La Trope University. My name is Jan Libich, and I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Stephen, uh, Professor Stephen King from Monash University. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me, Jan. Um, uh, Professor King is, uh, is a very uh, esteemed researcher, but he's contributed on many other fronts. He was also dean um, at Monash University, and uh, he also served as a commissioner at the ACCC, uh, uh, Australian Competition and Consumer uh, Commission. And this is actually the topic of our interview today. We'll be talking about public policies, we'll be talking about government regulation, uh, topics like healthcare, um, infrastructure, uh, competition, and so on. So let's start um, with one of the books that you wrote, and you wrote, you've written many. Uh, with Joshua Gantz, uh, you wrote a book called Finishing the Job, and yes. it was all uh, full of ideas about how to improve public policies. Let's start with healthcare. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about healthcare and maybe healthcare financing and what the problems are and what the solutions are there? Okay, Jan. Um, the best division that we can start off with is to separate very much healthcare financing, as you mentioned, from the provision of healthcare. And those two things are sometimes confused, uh, not just in Australia, but around the world. And the big question that we tried to tackle in that book was to look at the current Australian system of health insurance, which is health financing through the Medicare system and through the private insurance systems that back up Medicare, and the incentives and constraints that the government's put on that system uh, in particular, we we're interested in trying to work out what are the incentives, um, are they right, are they helping people get health care, or are they actually standing in the way of people getting health care? And what was your conclusion? Well, the Medicare system in Australia suffers from, uh, I'll call it uh, the Australia Post disease. The Australia Post disease is the use of pricing for one product to either subsidise another product or to subsidise other consumers of that product. Um, the classic example, of course, being postal services worldwide, where urban uh, consumers end up subsidising rural consumers and, in fact, uniform pricing for postage is called postage stamp pricing for that very reason. It's done in every country. Mm. So there's a subsidy built into the price. The same happens with Medicare. Medicare is actually quite explicit. The Medicare scheme is designed so that everybody pays their taxes uh, under the progressive tax scheme we've got in Australia. Wealthier individuals will pay more towards Medicare than uh, poorer individuals, which is a good thing. There's also this Medicare levy. Uh... There's also the Medicare levy, um, which is part of your income taxes. Uh, and obviously, if you earn more, you pay more because that's a flat 2%. Uh, there's also incentives for private individuals, uh, sorry, for wealthier individuals to buy private health insurance. So if you earn more than a certain amount and you don't buy private health insurance, then you get a big whack in your tax from the government. So the government essentially gives you an incentive to buy private health insurance. That private health insurance does two things. It covers things that Medicare don't cover, uh, it covers the extras, if you like. So if you want uh, a private bed, if you want choice of your own doctor, in particular, if you want to avoid, avoid waiting lists mm -hmm. for some elective surgery, private health cover or private health insurance is a product for you. But it also doubles up with Medicare. So a lot of the payments that are made by private insurance companies when you go into, for example, a public hospital for emergency care, well, if you didn't have private insurance, mm. they'd be paid for by the Medicare insurance scheme. Mm. So there's this doubling up. That's quite deliberate to try and, and make the And if I recall, your more. argument was that we kind of want to have more people in the private uh, sector because that frees up some of the resources in the public sector. That's, a, that's the idea behind the argument, that what it's doing is it's essentially like a progressive tax scheme. I personally would prefer a much more transparent scheme. I would prefer if we simply said... We've got a universal health cover system called Medicare. If you want the extras, if you want the, uh, the private health insurance to get your own doctor or private room, avoid the waiting list, that's fine. You go out and pay for that separately. And we have higher tax rates so that there's explicitly a transfer from the wealthiest parts of Australia to pay for the health insurance of the poorest parts of Australia. The trouble with the current system is that it makes the richer people pay more by this sort of transfer, mm -hmm. you pay for the mm -hmm. same insurance twice. You also have another group paying more. And the question we ask in the book is, who else would want private health insurance? And the answer is those who are at the highest risk of requiring health cover. In particular, health cover for things that are not emergencies, 
but it's still pretty deleterious. There's two main groups in society that uh, probably want health cover, private health cover, but aren't necessarily rich. And they're the elderly. So if you want a hip operation and you haven't got private health cover, the waiting list can be a year. That's mm. a lot of pain for a year. So there's an incentive for the elderly, even if they're not rich, to get private health insurance to avoid the year wait. The other group is young families with young children. Young children tend to do things like break bones. Also, that's a time why when... They do that? I don't know why they do that. You know, why do they play uh, these nasty, rough games like football? You also are at a stage of the child's life where you're learning about the child's health prospects. Mm. And it's those early first five to six years where a lot of uh, long-term mm. issues, health issues, may first be diagnosed and where that private health cover provides you with the backup. So we've got a system that tries to push the wealthy into private health cover by doubling up, by having this, mm. if you don't buy it, you get penalised, mm. but it also essentially is paying twice for the same coverage. But that actually captures the elderly as well and young families as well. Exactly the sort of people that we don't, you know, they're the people we want covered. They're so the people we want to be insured. So this is, I think, why you call it anti-insurance. That's what, exactly what do you, what why, do you, yeah. What do you do with that? How do well, you design the system? How do you get around the system? Well, the real... The benefit of getting around the system or, the, or the, the correct way to get around the system is to say that the current system has been designed to try and be progressive. It's trying to make the richer pay more, which is good. Uh, I personally am in favour of a much more progressive tax system in Australia than the one that we've currently got. We currently are actually a quite low tax country. I think we should be taxed more for things like the, a universal mm. healthcare system. But at the moment, we try and do it through the back door. We try and hide the tax. So we say, well, there'll be a tax, but only if you don't go out and buy mm. private health insurance. By the way, when you buy that private health insurance, you're actually getting some services that you're already getting through the, mm. the tax system, through the Medicare system, but we don't want you to access them through the Medicare system. Mm. A much better system would be to simply say, you know what, Medicare is truly universal. It covers everybody for the services they need uh, at a particular level of care. There may still and almost certainly will still be waiting lists for certain uh, procedures. If you want the extras, private room, private doctor, or to get around the waiting list, you pay and can go out and mm. buy explicitly private health insurance. And we have a more progressive mm. tax system. You know, let's have people who are earning, you know, families earning over $100,000 a year. Let's increase their taxes mm. and have that money, if you like, dedicated towards the Medicare health insurance system. Make it clean and transparent. I guess some people would argue that this is, again, you know, the, the better services would only be for the rich, but this is already happening. In that's the, in al the that's already the system. situation. But th th there's a bigger issue here. It seems like most healthcare systems around the world uh, are struggling financially. The, the per, per capita um, expenditure is, is growing much faster than the, than, than the economy, uh, and the projections are not looking good, especially when you take into account the aging populations, because you know the, the more older people you have, the, the more you pay. So are there any, and we know that going all private is also not a solution. If you look at the US, yeah. I think they spend twice as much of their GDP, uh, proportion of their GDP as some other countries on healthcare and their health outcomes are actually not very good. So, so, so where's the problem here? What's the kind of big solution? Uh, uh, if, if we shouldn't be all yeah. private healthcare, yep. if you shouldn't be all public, where's the I actually balance? think Australia is pretty close. Uh, as part of that project, uh, looking at health insurance in Australia, uh, Joshua and I looked at a range of different health insurance systems around the world, from the American system, which is almost completely private, um, with uh, a Obama, public welfare. Obamacare has tried to Obamacare change is changing that. that. Uh, through to the Canadian system, which is very strongly public, very little private involvement. But of course, uh, you know, on one side of the border, uh, one side of Lake Michigan, you end up with uh, individuals uh, unable to pay for cancer treatment. On the other side of Lake Michigan in Toronto, you have individuals who, because of a waiting list in the public hospitals, can die of a heart attack because whilst they're on the waiting list for surgery. Uh, n neither of those sound like particularly mm. desirable solutions. I actually think in Australia, and we came to this conclusion, that in Australia we've actually got a pretty good balance. We've got that good mix of public and private insurance. Uh, we should be looking at redesigning our system around the edges, but it doesn't need a major overhaul. Uh, I think fortuitously, I don't think it was actually uh, particularly, you know, no one, no one 
uh, came up with a brainstorm and said, let's come up with this mm. system we've got in Australia. It's evolved over time since Medibank was originally introduced back in the early 1970s by the Whitlam government. It's evolved to our current system, but it actually works really well. The areas where it doesn't work well is with the current funding of the health insurance system. That needs to be made transparent to avoid the anti-insurance problem. The other area where it doesn't uh, work particularly well is in the issue of who provides the services. So at the moment, we have this division between public and private health insurance, and that spills over into public and private provision of health services. Now, if you've got public health insurance, if you're a public patient, that doesn't mean you have to go into public hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, it does in Australia, but it shouldn't mean that. So the government should actually be there saying, we want to now work out how to buy the health products that we want for our citizens in the best possible way, the best mix of public and private hospitals. So that's the other area where Australia is lagging. Um, but compared to most of the world, I, you know, I, on no ground should we do a massive change in our health insurance system because we are actually one of the best in the world. You, you mentioned that we kind of slowly converged to a pretty good system. It seems to be the case in, in many other areas in Australia. I recently interviewed uh, uh, Professor Bruce Chapman, who was the designer of the student <coughs> loan system. And yep. we seem to have one of the best systems in the world. Similarly, the, the pension systems. Uh, when I asked John Piggott uh, recently about designing the optimal a pension system. He said the, the Australian system is pretty close to, to that ideal. So uh, it kind of brings up the issue of, you know, how come we uh, Australian institutions seem to be uh, at a very um, high level? I mean, do you have a view on seem that? Seem to be right. Look, I, I actually think that Australia, uh, the Australian policy debate tends to come up with a very good mix of equity and efficiency. Uh, if you have the same debates in, say, the US, there tends to be a strong efficiency line and not very much on the equity line, or a lot less than in Australia. If you have the debate in some European countries, then I think probably the equity arguments tend to dominate the efficiency arguments. In Australia, whether it's due to our background, whether it's due to our, our magnificent cultural mix that we have in this society, we've got a great balance between the equity and efficiency. So there's a lot of policies that need fiddling around at the margins to improve. Health insurance is one. Um, I think the HEC scheme, subject to issues in the recent federal budget, the HEC scheme for uh, tertiary education is a brilliant idea that's being translated overseas. Uh, and on the other one, which is pensions and the superannuation scheme, I think we've got pretty close to a well-designed scheme up until the time you retire. I don't think that we've actually got to the point where we can say post-retirement, we've got a great scheme. Uh, because at the moment, the incentives aren't quite right. And I know John himself has also written on that, uh, that issue. Mm. That being said, I think as our population gets older and uh, more people retire with superannuation balances, I would expect in the next three to six years, we'll see changes in superannuation to try and fix up the problems that we have post-retirement. Let's, let's move on to other areas of public policy. Let's think about infrastructure. I mean, yeah. there's, there's always this issue of who should provide infrastructure. And I, I think people generally agree that governments should build road and so on um, and, and various other um, kind of essential um, infrastructure projects. But things, about the, things like the National Broadband Network, uh, where you have a kind of internet uh, network, is that, is that a good idea? Should it be provided by the government or should it be... Uh, kind of in the realm of uh, the private sector. Well, not, I'm not necessarily going to let you get away with uh, government should build roads uh, <laughs> all right, argument. All right, well. uh, we've got an east-west uh, link tunnel uh, that's on the drawing boards, at least in uh, Victoria. Now, that will be owned by the government, um, at least uh, initially. Well, actually, let me step back a bit. The, the strategy for that is for the government to take a risk-owning role um, so the government will control the risk um, associated with uh, traffic flows mm -hmm. on that road, but for actually to be a private road, so developed privately and the private uh, uh, party that runs the road, if I can call it that, will be paid for their services. You start getting into these grey areas with contracts as That's, to who I, actually owns what. I suppose this goes back to your postage uh, situation. Obviously, this may be the case uh, for some kind of lucrative areas, but probably not, not some kind of regional road 
so this is yeah. again and when, when the kind of yeah. richer areas subsidize the smaller areas. So, but but again, uh, right. let's let's NBN. let's talk about the, uh, the okay. national broadband network. Okay. In many countries, this is actually done privately. It's, yeah. Uh, okay. The, the NBN is my personal view, one of the worst policy disasters that we've had in the last decade, mm. well and truly, probably go back 40 years. It's hard to find one that is poorly designed as the NBN. So the first question to always ask is, what's the problem? Why do we need government investment in this area? Why, why isn't public sector, uh, why isn't the private sector left to its own devices going to be successful? And the NBN is the answer is obvious. Uh, you can't run broadband out to rural and regional Australia. It's simply never going to be profitable. The density of population isn't there. Um, but that's the, that's the problem. So how do you then solve that problem? Well, a sensible solution would have been to say, OK, we, the government, are going to step in and build broadband infrastructure in rural and regional Australia. We're going to make sure there's an equity of access to high-speed internet across Australia and we're going to cover those areas where the market isn't going to work. Mm. That would have been a sensible mm. thing. We would have had a rural and regional broadband network, an RRBN. Why did we end up with a national broadband network? First thing to note, there is no problem in the cities. So, for example, if you look at the Melbourne CBD and inner city area, we've had competition there for at least 12 to 15 years. In fact, when I was at the ACCC, uh, one of the things that the ACCC does is it regulates telecommunication systems, it's never regulated the central business district telecommunication systems. Why? Because there's so much broadband, there's so much fibre in the centre of Australia cities that you want high speed broadband, there's 10 people who can provide it to you, to your door, to your basement, whatever. So there's no problem there. There's really no problem in the outer suburban areas until you start getting into low population. Why? Well, You've already got the ADSL, so you've got the copper, you've got at least two cables going past a lot of the suburbs and certainly one cable, which is the Foxtel cable. The Optus cables also are still out there to provide broadband. In full of that, and you immediately have, and perhaps some separation of Telstra, you immediately have a couple of competing uh, broadband suppliers. Uh, it starts looking like there's no problem. So why did we get a national broadband scheme? And it seems like Telstra would have built something similar of Telstra by themselves. It, well, it, it, let, let me get to Telstra because Telstra is exa a great example of what the problem is. So now, why do we have a national broadband system? It's called the post office problem again. We've got a situation where the government wants to provide a rural and regional broadband network. Damn, that's expensive. We can't have a we can't charge commercial rates. It's just not going to make any money. That's why we have to intervene. That means higher taxes. Higher taxes. That's electorally unpopular. Let's hide the tax. How are we going to hide it? What we're going to do is build a national broadband and make the people in the cities pay for the country users. So we'll have a postage stamp or a uniform price across Australia, but that means the price in the cities is massively above a competitive price. And of course, it's a subsidised price in the bush, which is what we want in the bush. So the national broadband scheme is national. We've got all this infrastructure being built that quite frankly would have been built privately. The private sector would have taken the risk in the cities. And the pricing is going to have a hidden tax. The tax is going to be on internet usage. What madness. Yeah. If we're building the NBN because it is the future of the Australian economy, because it's going to help transactions, it's going to help commerce, it's going to help entrepreneurs, we're going to have e-medicine, we're going to have e-learning, and we're going to tax it. We've come up with a system where we're going to put a great big tax just on the thing that we think is a huge productivity enhancing part of our economy. It's completely insane. This, this, this doesn't seem to be the only area where government policies, maybe well-intentioned, actually turn out to be counterproductive. Yeah. Why, why is it? Is it that the politicians kind of don't listen to economists enough and don't, don't think through all the incentive issues and so on? Why, why is it that sometimes, I mean, we can go back to the recent uh, fiscal stimulus and think about the insulation fiasco and yep. things like that. You know, why is it that, you know, even well-intentioned government policies may fail uh, so badly? Yeah, I, I think it's that, you know, well, we're economists and we both know, I won't ask the audience, we both know that economists have unique and overarching wisdom for society. Of course. Unfortunately, <laughs> politicians seem to have uh, this view that they need votes. They haven't read your uh, book. Uh, they haven't read the book. Um, if only they would, they would be inspired and work out the truth. 
Um, politics is a process where you know, you're seeing it at the moment. If the government's got to pretend it's not putting up taxes, mm. so it puts levies on. Um, at the same time, it, you know, there's more demands for government spending. It's got to try and balance those mm. from a political perspective, and that's hard. Mm. And what we see in Australia is that attempt to balance, meaning that we try and hide a whole bunch of taxes, and that's just bad policy. Let's, let's think about some other areas. Utilities, so things like electricity and rail networks. Well, I hit you on roads before, so yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do better. <laughs> uh, and, um, there's, there's been a lot of privatization in, in many countries, as, yep. as well as in Australia. But uh, there are still people who, who argue that these are kind of uh, some, somehow special industries and, you know, they shouldn't be fully privatized. What's your view on that? Is the, I mean, people argue that about the financial system, too, in yep. many ways. And we might talk a little bit about this uh, in relation to the global financial crisis. But what do you think about privatization uh, in in utilities? Uh, okay. Uh, the first thing to realize about utilities is that in areas like electricity transmission or distribution, gas transmission or distribution, they're what we call natural monopolies. So they're situations where competition isn't going to work. And that's just not a theoretical argument. We have about 200 years of history on natural monopolies, attempts for competition in natural monopolies and that competition failing. So it goes back to the canals in Europe, um, early transport mm -hmm. networks before you had uh, uh, even rail, uh, far less cars. You built great big canals and you had barges moving back and forth along the canals. And it was pretty quickly realised that if you had one canal, which was making a lot of money, and someone tried building another canal next door to try and get some of that money, all that happened was, once you built the canal, the marginal cost of an extra barge on that canal was very low. You had prices crash. One or other of the companies went bankrupt and was taken over by the other company. So they were early natural monopoly infrastructure. And then you go through roads, bridges, electricity systems, gas systems. The electricity system, for example, in a number of countries, wasn't originally publicly owned. It ended up being publicly owned or nationalised because competition meant that the companies were failing. So, so can I just so yeah. and the natural monopoly occurs wherever the fixed cost of building the infrastructure is too high. Where the fixed cost is very big relative to the marginal cost, mm -hmm. um, at least up until you hit a capacity constraint. Yeah. And so in the case of electricity distribution, one set of wires down a suburban street is more than enough to carry all the electricity for that street. Uh, even if the company was charging a monopoly price, making lots of money, if somebody else came in and strung up another set of wires, that would just lead the price to crash. They wouldn't be able to make any money. One of them would have to drop out, and then most likely the other company would take it over and create the monopoly again. So there is a, there is a definite role in natural monopolies for regulation. You have to have a regulator sitting in there regulating the prices and making sure that you have reasonable economic prices because there isn't competition isn't going to work. Mm. That's a different question to the one you asked. You said, should it be government owned? And that's a much more tricky question. That comes back to this issue, you want regulation, what's the best way to regulate it? Now, traditionally, the best way to control one of these large companies, a large electricity company or a large gas company, uh, a road company, for example, was to actually have it under government ownership and to directly control it through that ownership. But actually economics, and this is one of the, the triumphs, if I can call it that, of the last 30 years of microeconomics. Microeconomics has come up with a whole lot of really interesting ways that you can design better regulatory regimes. You can get over, or at least partially get over, the issues that the person running the company always knows much more than the person trying to set the prices. So as that regulation's improved, there's less need to have it under government ownership. Mm. And you can actually say, well, we can put it under private ownership. That's got some good things. There's more incentive to lower cost. Of course, there's more incentive to try and push up prices. But because we've got better regulatory instruments, because we know so much more now about regulation than we did 30 years ago, we can probably control the bad side of private ownership and keep the good side of private ownership. So your view would be kind of more towards full, full privatization with with a good regulatory system. Well, I think again, by luck or management, we've actually ended up coming out of the uh, Hilma report uh, back in the early 1990s. We had a good process put in place to say 
isolate out the natural monopoly, work out where the problem is. The other bits, there's no need for government ownership under the other bits. So you don't have government owned electricity generators in Victoria anymore. Why not? Well, it was realised pretty early on that you could have competing electricity uh, generators. Mm. So there's no need for government ownership. That's not where the problem is. What about the transmission and the distribution system where there is a natural monopoly? Well, there you have to work out what's the balance. Do you want to keep it under government ownership? We have some issues relating to the way that the system's run is may not be run at least cost, but is that better or is it better to have private with an arm's length regulator? Now, that debate's still going on in practical terms in Australia, but certainly in electricity, I think the privatise and regulate model has shown that it works at least as well, if not better. In fact, the bizarre thing about the last two years of debate in electricity is that the debate has all been about there being high prices in electricity transmission. Where? Where the government mm -hmm. still owns the assets. So in Victoria, the transmission prices under the private system look like they're considerably lower than in New South Wales and Queensland, where they're still government-owned assets. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the final nail in the mm -hmm. public ownership coffin of at least electricity assets. And we'll see those moving out into private ownership with arm's length regulation. Okay. Let's move on to another area, and that's education. We're on academic uh, uh, soil. Um, and you as former Dean uh, at Monash uh, obviously ha have a lot of insights into this area. Um, you, you have a paper, I think, in 2004 where you look at the uh, primary school system. and, and yeah, it's Primary financing. and secondary, yeah. Uh, primary and sec secondary. Um, and you identify some problems as well as some solutions uh, and some suggestions for changes. Can you briefly tell us what your story is in terms of... Uh, this kind of level of education before we move on to um, tertiary, tertiary education. education. Okay. The, and I guess we all follow our experience. We had, uh, my wife and I had kids at primary school at that level, so uh, you picked up well, but it was really focusing on the primary school level. But our starting point, uh, and this was some work for the Victorian, started off with some work for the Victorian government, was to say, how should you think about schools from an economic perspective? And schools are a classic case of what economists call a club good. So it's something that we desire that's produced best by a community or a group of people. So you could have a school, you, know, you could have private tutoring for everyone, not very efficient. What we'd prefer in general for educating our children is to have a community institution, we call it a school, either a primary or a secondary school, and parents contribute to that school, their children go to that school and are educated appropriately at that school. And we have a mixture of public and private owned schools in Australia. The problem for the publicly owned schools in Australia is that they're then put into very, very tight straitjackets. In particular, in public schools in Australia, publicly owned schools in Australia, even if 90% of the school community said, we want some more resources, we want, to, we want to be able to pay fees to hire a new science teacher or to have a new gym or to have better facilities for our children. They're very limited in their ability to do that, except through fundraising type drives. So it would have to be a charitable donation. It couldn't be treated as a fee for t attending that school. And the reason for that is an equity argument. What about the 10%? If there's 10% of uh, impoverished families or poorer families at that school, it may not be fair on them. But how do you then get around that trade-off? You want a school community to be able to build and have a real sense of uh, investment and uh, ownership mm. of, a, of a publicly owned school, of that school system. But how do you protect the poor? The way that we were thinking was to say, okay, rather than the government simply saying every student is identical, the government can say we will have a certain contribution to the school or the education of a particular child, but that contribution can depend on the income of the parents. So if you come from a wealthy family, we, the government, may say that's $10,000 for each student. Whichever school they go to, that's $10,000 given to that mm -hmm. school to help educate the cost of educating that child. What about if you come from a wealthier family? Well, maybe the contribution from the government's only $6,000 or maybe only $5,000. Mm -hmm. The school can then determine the level of fees up to the maximum. So let's say the maximum is 10000 So the poorer families, they're covered completely by the government. The school can then work out exactly what resources it wants within that range between 5000 and 10000 and can then work out 
where the resources are spent through the school council, through the school principal, through the teachers and the broader school community. But it seems that the effect it would have is to push kind of the wealthier families more towards the private uh, uh, private sector. But the funding then has to be the same for the private sector as well as for the public sector. So right. for the private sector has a choice. The private schools can either say, no, we're just going to set our fees and give up our current government mm. funding. And the private school system gets significant federal government funding at the moment. Mm. Or it can say, we want to be part of that system, in which case we have to play by the same rules as the public schools, as the publicly owned schools. Now, to the degree, one of the things we explored in the paper was to say, well, if that's too much of a restriction on some of the schools, should schools be allowed to pay more? So if a maximum amount was 10000 for a poor student, should a school be allowed to set, say, 12000 or $14,000 as a scholarship? And our suggestion there was, you may want to allow that so long as you say, well, perhaps for every dollar over 10000 you raise in fees, 20% or 25% has to be used to support poorer students mm. or students from minority backgrounds, st Indigenous students and so on. The whole aim of this is to set up an incentive scheme so that students from less well-off backgrounds become the most desirable students for schools. So at the moment you sort of have a, have a bit of a race to the bottom in Australian mm. education where, as you mentioned, the wealthier families mm. leave, get government funding still, go off to a private school where there's no constraints on the fees that that private school can charge. What we want to do is create the incentives where schools, whether they're private or public, say, you know what, we want more minority students. We want more students from poor. When you say we, you mean the as school a community, w welfare of the of the society as a whole. Because well, you want to bring in, in that situation, we want the school communities to actually say we want a more diverse mix of, uh, of students. Again, but is it, is it in the interest of the, I, I think what well, you have in mind is yep. that this is the interest of the, the whole society as such. It may not be in the interest of that elite club that may... That's right, yeah. So, so it's, it's in the interest of the individual schools and my personal view is, and this is where economics starts becoming, uh, you know, stepping over to the line into uh, social views, but my view is it's also a good thing for society. Mm -hmm. Let's let's move on to tertiary education, and there was a bit of a, a debate uh, about this, uh, given yep. the, the, the last <clears throat> Australian budget that basically removed the, the cap on the on student fees, uh, and some people worry that student fees might increase, uh, you know, two or three times. Uh, yep. So, what's what's your view on this whole area uh, of kind of regulating tertiary education fees um, and so on, lifting the cap? Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a classic situation where the government um, and some of its advisors just haven't thought through the issues. So the first issue, there will still be a HECS or what is called a fee help scheme, the same as there has been for postgraduate study. Um, and we can actually use postgraduate study as a bit of guidance as to what's going to happen in the undergraduate area with the, the freeing up or the ability to charge uh, higher fees. Um, what we've seen there is a very big price dispersion. All, all, the, all the fees will go up. That's, that's, uh, that's not even uh, any point debating that. Uh, England's the most recent example where uh, government allowed higher fees. They set a, a, a cap on the high fees. Surprise, surprise, every university just went up to the cap and is coordinated on the cap. So we will see fees they go up. They basically removed all the subsidies within that uh, government uh, loan scheme, yep. right? Uh, whereas... In Australia, we still have about, We've had the subsidized, yeah. about 50% subsidy. Yeah. And they get, they're getting rid of some of the subsidies, so the interest rate's going up from the CPI up to uh, the government bond rate. But there's still a non-trivial subsidy going on there. You're yeah. still able to defer it. Um, uh, you still, you know, it, it's a sort of loan that you wouldn't be able to walk into a bank and get, let's put it that way. Um, so we would expect to see undergraduate fees go up. We will expect to see a big difference in fees so unfortunately, Jan, uh, Latrobe, looking at the postgraduate areas, is not the winner here. Who are the winners? The group of eight. The elite universities will be massive winners on this. And yes, I think you will see some of the group of eight universities' fees going up by you know, three times is not out of order. Uh, and the way to see that is to ask where are their international fees. So the international undergraduate fees at group of eight universities in say a business course, which is the one I'm familiar with, are around $30,000 a year. The undergraduate fee at the moment in Australia for a domestic student is around $10,000 a year. 
doesn't take a genius to work out that when the university is saying, oh, 30,000, 10,000, 30,000, 10, 30,000. Mm -hmm. So well, in fact, there are some people who, who, who believe that the, the fee for Australian students may actually be higher than the fee for international students because, because of the, all, all the additional benefits of, of hacks. Uh, so it's kind of low, low interest and that sort of thing, which would, which would potentially justify, which increases the value of that. Uh, uh, Could be. And, and if universities were competitive, well-run institutions, I would agree that that's a possibility. My view, though, is that so they, they haven't really thought through what the fees will be. They haven't thought through the implicit subsidy in HEX. That's all fine. My big problem is they haven't actually thought through the way that universities are governed. So the universities in Australia are all public institutions. Their ownership is a bit grey, but they're all set up under either state or federal legislation. They are run by their councils. The councils are sort of appointed by a mixture of people, but the vice chancellors have a fair control of who gets appointed to councils, and they're run day to day by vice chancellors and an administrative team. But there's very little uh, in the way of a line of responsibility and a line of control not just compared to the private sector, but even compared to standard public organisations. So when we were at the ACCC, as a receiver of taxpayers' money, as a public organisation, we had Senate estimates. At least two times a year, the senior team from the ACCC were up there being grilled by the senators. And believe me, you got a grilling um, on your performance. They knew well and truly what you were doing. Vice chancellors don't go up before Senate mm -hmm. estimates. They don't get grilled in that way. They just have to answer to a council, which is part-time members drawn from a very broad community, some of them recommended by the vice chancellors. This is a very odd mm -hmm. and bizarre and quite frankly, I think, mm -hmm. dysfunctional ownership and control arrangement. Mm -hmm. So you're now going to say to these institutions that you know it's not clear who actually runs and controls them you're going to say to them, you now have to go out there and compete by setting prices as if you were a private firm. You don't have any of the private firm incentives. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody's getting a dividend from this. Mm -hmm. Go out there and compete and pretend like you're a private mm -hmm. firm, but we're not going to check up on what you do. So, so given this um, ownership structure, you think lifting the cap was a bad idea? I think unless you fix the ownership structure, a large number of Australian universities will be getting a massive great big windfall and I think the Australian community may not see a lot coming out the other end. Mm. So what we've really got to ask is, if we're giving more money to our universities, which is what this fee change is going to do, who's responsible for making sure that it's spent appropriately? Where is that money going to be spent? Is it going to be fed back into undergraduate education? You and I are both academics. So, you know, I don't know about your uh, view, Jean, but I wouldn't be betting on much of that money going back mm. into improved undergraduate education. Mm. You know, it may go off into more uh, very expensive toys for science and medical research. That might be a good thing. But we're talking about billions of dollars of here mm. where there seems to be within public institutions but without even the controls that you normally have on public mm. institutions. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. Mm. Well, let's let's hope there'll be an improvement. But let's move on to it quickly because we're running out of time. Let's let's briefly look at some other areas. Uh, one of the uh, area where there seems to be need for regulation is the is the credit card fees. And there was an, an inquiry by the the Reserve Bank of Australia. You you have a paper on this. Yep. So about ten years ago, there was there were some changes implemented to kind of reduce the, the fees that credit card companies change. Can you just briefly tell us a, a, about, about this and what your suggestions were, okay. what, the, what the outcomes were? So the RBA did part of what we suggested, but then didn't do the rest of it. So again, Joshua Gans and I uh, looked at this particular issue. Um, it's a really interesting issue. It's what we call a two-sided market. So you've got merchants and you've got consumers. Consumers want to carry a credit card that merchants accept. Merchants only want to accept credit cards that consumers carry. So there's a coordination issue going on there. They each have a bank and the interchange fee is the fee that the banks charge each other. Um, in credit cards, the interchange fee is positive. So the merchant's bank pays a fee to the customer's bank. Interestingly, in FPOS, so uh, taking out through your debit card, uh, traditional debit card in Australia, the interchange fee actually runs the other way. So uh, there's no reason why the fee has to run one way or another mm. way. It just depends on how the mm. system's set up. 
there was a problem in Australia and around the world, and Australia was one of the early leaders on reform in this area, where the credit card systems had rules that made it impossible for the merchant to say, hang on, this card is costing me a lot more than if you paid with another card or if you paid with cash. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to pay an extra $2 or an extra 1% or whatever if you want to pay with that card. That option was not available to merchants. There was a policy, a no surcharge policy. So if you accepted, say, Visa, you were not allowed to charge a different price to anyone with a Visa card than if they had a MasterCard, diners, or cash. So what were the RBA's uh, reforms? The RBA was worried about these fees. They saw the fees as being too high, and they were correct. They were too high. But the reason why they were too high was because of this no surcharge. What, happening, what was happening was Merchants have to cover their costs. So if credit cards are costing more than cash, what happens? You set a price that balances out. Those paying cash pay more. Those paying credit cards are being subsidised. Well, who pays cash? Well, actually, the statistics are quite clear. The poorest parts of the Mm. community pay cash. So we had this bizarre situation where the credit card company rules Mm. were meaning that poorer people were paying for richer people. And you don't want this regressivity. This didn't sound very good. What were our recommendations? Easy. Change the rules. Once you change the rules, once you allow surcharging, that interchange fee, it's just a price. It's not Mm. going to matter very much. If a reserve bank really wants to regulate it, it can regulate it, but you can show that the effects of a regulation are second order. Mm. Unfortunately, the the reserve bank, well, fortunately, it did the good things. It did require the credit card systems to change their rules. And we've had some surcharging, we've seen some differentiation. We now have merchants who quite clearly on the very expensive card, Diners and Amex, will say, hey, if you want us to pay those, it's 5% extra because essentially that's what the merchants are charged. Um, But the Reserve Bank also actually tried regulating the interchange fee. I think there it was wasting its time. Once it fixed the rules, it should have stepped back and let the market work. Another area um, of regulation is the... uh um, and this is a, a broader issue of, uh, of piracy, um, intellectual property. But uh, one area I often travel, and this is very annoying when you have these uh, regional restrictions on, on your DVDs, you know, DVDs that you can watch in Australia, you can't always watch in, in Europe and so on. And this, is, and this is a big area of, you know, piracy. Do you have any insights about what, what we should do? Is it, you know, who's, who's right? The people who, who download music and, and, and say that... Uh, uh, the companies uh, charge too much money for the for all the products, or is it that the 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 owners of the property rights, uh, you know, all the big studios? Who, who's right here? Okay. Uh, well, I, I was going to make a joke about you, know, you buy DVD, but I won't, <laughs> just in case there's anyone watching this. Uh, I always buy DVDs and don't know what uh, torrent streaming services are. Thank you. Um, <laughs> normal programming will now resume. <laughs> This is just price discrimination. You know, this is something we teach our first year students, Mm. undergraduate students. Um, If you can charge a price to people with less sensitive demand, less elastic demand, to use the economic term, Mm. if you can charge them a higher price and a lower price to more price sensitive customers, you want to do that to Mm. maximise your profit. So that's all this inter-regional DVD restrictions are. Um, DVDs are actually a minor part of it now. The big case or the big area that we're seeing it is with goods, electronic goods that can be downloaded through the internet or with physical goods that you buy over the internet. Mm. Don't believe me? Get onto Amazon and try ordering some of the stuff with an Australian Mm. credit card. And you'll suddenly say, find out, I'm not allowed to buy this Mm. stuff. There's a price. We've got the goods. I want to buy them. You know, why won't they let me buy them? Well, because there's... The suppliers have got rules in place saying, look, Amazon, it's okay for you to sell to the US at that price, but there's no way you can sell to Australia at that price because we want to charge them a higher price. So this international price discrimination occurs, it's occurring more and more. You know, for days when it was just DVDs, we could ignore it. Now it's becoming a real problem. How do we solve it? There was a Senate inquiry last year. And it sort of came up with the results that sort of, eh, we're not sure how to solve it. Um, hopefully a bit of pressure will get the companies like uh, Adobe is the classic example where you know, what you download here for $4,000, you can download from the same server. But if you are based in the US and have a US IP address, you can download it for $1,000. Same server, same software. Um, the Senate sort of you know, hoped that something would fix it up automatically. I, I think their hopes 
uh, not well based. The Canadians have got so annoyed about this because the Canadians sit there looking below the border and saying, damn, why are we paying so much more than those guys south of the border? They're actually thinking of bringing in a new rule into their competition laws to say that you're not allowed to sell it cheaper in uh, the U. If you sell it cheaper in the US, you must sell it for that price in mm. Canada. That's probably going to be a complete nightmare. How do you, how do you, how do you enforce something mm. like that? I think what we need to do in Australia is think carefully about the rules that these companies are using to be able to price higher to us and make sure that we're not supporting rules that enables it. So what rules? Well, the obvious one is copyright or IP laws. Why can't I just go to the US, download a copy of the Adobe software, bring it back to Australia, copy it a thousand times and sell it? Well, because I'd be breaching Adobe's copyright over that material. But hang on, this is the same company that wants to charge us $4,000 and refuses to sell it to us, the same product at the same price from the same server in the US. So we've got to think about, well, we're using our own rules. We're using our own interpretation of copyright to allow them to rip us off. Mm. That seems to be bizarre. So I think we need to think about things like use it or lose it rules. If you don't sell a product in Australia and you're selling that product overseas, there should be no barrier to anyone legitimately buying it overseas in any quantities they like and bringing it into Australia. And if you try and stop them, that's a violation of competition laws. We need to think about our copyright laws and say, well, actually, if, you're, if someone buys a legitimate copy of your good anywhere in the world, they can resell it in Australia. And you know what? They can buy it 50 times or 60 times and resell it 50 or 60 times in Australia. So at the moment, you know, I think our own laws are our worst enemy in mm. this. Fix up the laws, then the market will work. And, and a similar area to copyright is obviously the patent system, where, which seems to be uh, badly broken. And I, I know that you were uh, uh, in court uh, as, a, as an expert uh, in one of the recent cases. Was it uh, Samsung? Uh, Samsung and Apple. Apple. Yep. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about this and what's wrong with the patent system and how we can maybe fix it? And, before, okay, I'll, before we move from to, on to the I'll, I'll be very questions. specific because uh, I'm not, a, not an expert on the patent system, but I do know more than I ever thought I would want to know about uh, patents, intellectual property, and things like mobile phones, so uh, de the devices we've got. Um, the starting point is to realise that when you pull out a mobile phone, you're pulling out a mass of intellectual property. And the standard, so let's say the 4G standard uh, that is becoming... Essentially, it's now the, the main standard for any new phone that you buy in Australia. That standard is set on an international basis, and it's set by standard setting by standard setting organisations. The phones are actually based in Europe. Um, the standard setting organisation is a group of market participants who get together and decide: okay, what intellectual property, what what uh, what uh, features are we going to include in this standard in terms of you know, how signals communicate with each other, how signals going one way come back the other way, um, how signals get downloaded to a phone, how mm. signals get uploaded from a phone. All of that involves intellectual property uh, and intellectual goods. And they basically come to an agreement about what intellectual property will be embodied in that standard. And all the parties to that standard, all the parties who have some of that intellectual property, have to put their hand in the air and say, yes, I, I, I have patents. I, I have intellectual property that you will need to make a 4G phone. You can't make a 4G phone unless you've got my intellectual property somewhere there in it. Um, and I guarantee that I'm going to license my intellectual property on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory basis. Fran. So called. what does that mean? That's a really good question. <laughs> Why are these companies like Apple, Samsung, Google fighting each other all around the world. Well, certainly in the case of the Apple and Samsung uh, matters, the basic case is Apple looked at Samsung and said, hang on, you're copying our phones. You've taken some of our IP. Samsung, which had intellectual property as part of the 3G and 4G standards, then came back and said, you, Apple, you're violating our intellectual property by selling phones that are 3G phones or 4G phones. So... The Samsung claims related to the standard essential patents. And the fight's been over. Well, Apple then came back and said, well, okay, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. And they've been fighting ever since about what that actually is. They means. had like 50 court cases around All the world. All around the world. And in some situations you've had, uh, 
you know, the extreme is the US where at one end where they basically said, look, for God's sake, just go away and sort it out for yourselves, to the other end where there are some authorities, I think it's uh, the Dutch or the Germans in Europe, have said that Samsung's broken the law of the antitrust mm. law, it's abusing market power by not giving what the court thought was a fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory mm. uh, uh, licence to Apple. So you've got this huge range. Mm. <clears throat> it's clearly a system that's broken. Um, it's clearly a system that has shown it, it can't work. What's been the defensive mechanism, by the way? Well, Apple has realised it needs a seat at the standard setting table. So it bought somebody with uh, some uh, intellectual property relating to mobile phone standards uh, just so that it could get a seat at the table so this wouldn't happen to it in the future. Mm. Google, same situation. Buys Motorola, takes out the patents, sells on the rest of the mm. business. All it wanted was the intellectual property so that Google, as a producer of uh, mobile phone operating systems and mobile phones, can get a seat at the table mm. to set the standards. I, I, I once read that Microsoft <coughs> is actually adding more than 1,000 patent applications every month in the US alone. And, and apparently the, the cost of... Uh, associated with all this uh, patent bureaucracy for most of these high-tech companies is actually greater than the than the money they spend on innovation itself. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I mean, th there really seems to be something when it gets wrong to that, that point, there's uh, clearly the system is broken, and we need to work out a way of fixing it. Now, there's a big debate about how should Fran be interpreted. Um, there's a lot of economists, particularly in the US, involved in this debate. Yeah, I, I think the underlying issue really has to be, is this the best way of setting standards? At the moment, you set the standard and then ex post you start talking about the price. That doesn't seem very sensible. Mm. I would have thought you talk about the price before you start buying the thing or making it essential. It needs a whole rethink. Mm. I don't think there's any easy answers, by the way, because these are very complex products. And by the way, you know, 4G is built on 3G, which was built on 2G. So even if you came up with a new system for the fifth generation phones or the sixth generation phones, then you're still going to be sitting there with a whole bunch of parties who say, well, sorry, you're still using our intellectual property and we're not playing by the new rules. Mm. We're still covered by the old rules. So, so this isn't a problem that's going to go away. It's going to get worse. Mm. Okay, well, let's turn to the audience. Uh, is there any questions, Linda? First of all, a quick comment and then a quick a question. Um, thanks for your um, elucidation of um, the university ownership and uh, responsibility for accounting. Uh, that was quite enlightening for many of us. Um, the second question, the question I want to ask is, um, in Australia, what is there about Australia that makes it more amenable to having monopolies in the supermarket industry? Oh, okay. Supermarkets are really interesting. Are we more concentrated in Australia than around the world? So that's the first question. So is your assumption that we've got higher concentration uh, correct? Uh, as a broad rule, yes, but be very careful how you interpret more concentration. Australia is big too, so Coles and Woolworths have about 80% of the dry grocery market. As soon as you then broaden it out, though, the share comes down because once you start getting to fresh uh, meat, uh, fish, uh, and fruit and vegetables, their market share is a lot lower. Uh, Australia, unlike some uh, European countries, for example, buy a lot of their fruit and vegetables from fruit and vegetable stores, a lot of meat still from butchers, a lot of fish from fishmongers. So once you get down to that level, you're talking more like 40 to 50% of coal, coals and Woolworths. Still a lot, but you do have to be careful. The second area where you have to be careful is to look at Australia versus other countries and remember that our population's low. Um, so if you look at Australia compared to the US, we look very concentrated. If you look at Australia compared to, say, Florida, then our supermarkets don't look that concentrated. All of that's really just background to say, you've got to be a bit careful. Yes, we are concentrated, in my opinion. So not wanting to avoid the premise, but just to clarify it. Why has that occurred? Very easy, logistic chains. It's happened all around the world, by the way. Um, the real difference is population. If you've got a bigger, denser population, you can support more supermarkets. But the reason why the mum and dad stores have tended to disappear is just integrated logistic chains have developed and the infrastructure, the software to drive those chains has become so much more sophisticated that big supermarkets are now much more efficient than smaller supermarkets. Where do we get to in Australia? Australia is sort of odd. I was involved in the ACCC's grocery inquiry in 2008, and that inquiry was driven 
by the concern that the supermarkets were pricing too high. And we looked at that. Uh, West Farmers had just taken over Coles. Coles was competing quite badly. Woolworths essentially had the ground, the, the game to itself. Um, we said, look, you know, there's some problems here, but you know, if Coles can actually get its act together, Metcash was growing quite substantially at that stage. It's, it's pulled back there, the IGA stores. Um, it's pulled back since then. There are some issues in the industry, but they're not detrimental almost. Let's see what happens next. Well, what's happened next is West Farmers with Coles started a discount price war that's hugely beneficial to the consumers, but is clearly having some problems for suppliers. So the issue in Australia is now flipped on its head, where the concern is now not that consumers are being ripped off, but the suppliers are being ripped off. What can we do about it? There's no point wishing for smaller grocery chains in Australia. Um, you could only do that if you had big inefficiencies in the logistics chain. Uh, Metcash finds it hard enough. Metcash supplies all the IGA stores. It finds it hard enough to run an efficient logistics chain with its market share. Um, so that's not a great way of going. That's just going to mean higher prices to consumers. I think the current ACCC case is really interesting and I, I think uh, it's a good idea to start making sure that the boundaries of those relationships between suppliers and the supermarkets are very clear. Um, during the grocery inquiry, we heard lots of stories about um, the way that suppliers were treated, uh, most of them, or a fair number, unsavoury. At that stage, you didn't have the current law, so unconscionable conduct for business-to-business -business transactions wasn't available. That was changed a couple of years ago, so the ACCC was given a new stick, and they're now using that stick. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Um, hopefully, the outcome will be fairer transactions between suppliers and the big supermarket chains without destroying what's been very beneficial competition for consumers. So if we can get a fairer landscape but still keep the competition there, we're all going to be winners. Excellent talk, by the way. Um, so I'm just curious one thing. So we've been talking about the solution often gravitates around regulate regulatory uh, outcome. So in Australia, do you feel that regulatory capture is not a problem, as it is, I think, in the States? The idea that, you know, the, the, the regu regulatory agency is, is it generally hires executives from firms, or at least uh, sympathetic to the, the firms in the industry. Yep. Um, we have regulatory capture, but it's different to the states. So, as you'll know, there's a Harper review or the Root and Branch review of competition reform. And one of the things that I think they should be looking at is the structure of our regulators. And in fact, we've got a Monash Business Policy Forum paper that's being written on exactly that. Um, in Australia, at the moment, we don't have a lot of individual uh, company type regulators. So, we used to have, for example, Austel, which was the telecommunications regulator. Um, and it just dealt with telecommunications. It's now part of the ACCC. We used to have individual electricity and gas regulators, a bit like the UK and a bit like the public utility regulatory authorities in the US. Um, they've now been rolled into the Australian Energy Regulator. And overall, that's a good thing and it's helped prevent that sort of capture. Um, where has there been capture? Interestingly, in Australia, the capture tends to be from the new entrants and the customers, not from the incumbent. So we don't have a long history of people leaving the regulators and going and working for the incumbent or people from the incumbent moving into the regulators. That's not been traditionally a path in Australia. And certainly in the old Austel days, who had captured Austel were probably the new entrants. So Austel went from being, in a sense, an arm's length regulator, you know, the referee, to sort of being a bit of a participant, sort of go Optus, go entrance, go Optus, go entrance. And that was also a problem. That, that's, not, that's not a good a result for regulation either. Um, a bit of that, I think, spilled across to the ACCC. And we have seen, I think, uh, and when I was at the Commission, I, I was trying to fight this from the inside, and I still see it from the outside. There is a bit of a, a culture within the telecommunications group to say Telstra is the enemy, not the firm that we're regulating. So there has been some capture, but it's sort of in a different type of capture in Australia. I think we do need to rethink how we structure our regulators. I think the idea of having a utility regulator like the telecommunications group within the ACCC, the rail and water groups within the ACCC, the AER is actually connected to the ACCC. I, I think they should actually be separated out from the competition regulator. They have very different roles. 
A utility regulator is all about interfering in the market. That's their job. That their job is to come out and set prices, to set standards. You know, their whole their whole raison d'etre is to manage the market. A competition regulator, they're more like a referee. They've got a set of rules and they have to enforce those rules to make sure we have fair and equitable behaviour in the marketplace. The last thing you want with a competition regulator is for them to get in there and say, let's start designing the market. Let, let's you know, think about, you know, maybe we'll break up coals today. Uh, you know, that, that would be a disaster for the way the economy works. Unfortunately, so they have very different cultures. And I think having those same cultures in one body means that the ACCC... Uh, you know, has a bit of bipolar disorder. You know, it's sort of got a competition hat, a, uh, an interference hat, a competition hat, an interference hat. Needs to have those hats separate, and I think separate bodies. Uh, I'm afraid this is all we have time for. Professor Stephen King, uh, let me yeah. thank you very, very much for your interesting views thank and you. for your ongoing contribution to uh, the Australian public policy. So I'd like to wish you all the best for the future and and and. The, the contribution to continue uh, in the years to come. Thank you very Thanks, much. Sir. Thank you. Brilliant.